I was trying to keep everything secret from everybody around me. Wow. Um, while at the same time being drugged around to cult rituals by this man and deliberately being used as access to these other dimensional places. Almost every mainstream religion is on, is on the shopping blocks there. I mean, this is, this is the human condition, and it has been for thousands of years, which I'm seeking to change here, is the idea that you've got to figure out what's bad and wrong about you, suppress, deny, reject, and disown it, and muscle yourself into, you know, siding with whatever righteousness is for your specific culture. It's never worked. It's a terrible formula, but we continue to do it. So how did you escape... That is shadow gold. You're exactly yeah. right. It's just the things that we felt ashamed of, we didn't want other people to know about, or maybe we felt was a vulnerable aspect of us. And yep. so we separate ourselves from it and say, I'm not that. Yep. But everything we see in this world, I now know is actually, I am that. I yes. am. I wish I had had this conversation with you a while ago. It definitely would have helped in a lot of these situations. Teal Swan, what a pleasure it is to have you here with me on this Think Tank episode. I have been watching your videos uh, very, very closely, I'd say for about 10 years. And I was just uh, talking to you about this before we started this, that you know I used to be a pharmaceutical CEO. And I think of all the pharmaceutical you know experiences I had, you probably red pilled me the most. And <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've been, you know, watching your work and your effort and everything. And, and first of all, I would love to ask you, how did you get to start doing this? You know, when did you figure out one day in your in your earlier life, oh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to red pill, you know, pharma CEOs and make them wake up. <laughs> well, that, that realization came quite late. Um... For me, going into this line of work was really going full circle because I started out as a medical intuitive. So as a child, I was basically, you know, talking to my parents about all the stuff that I was seeing in people's bodies and talking about auric fields. And of course, my two scientific parents had no idea what to do with that. Um, so wait, I was targeted. I you, 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 when you say, let's just go back one, <laughs> rewind one second. Your two scientific parents, can you yeah. explain a little bit about that? Well, my, my parents are both like highly educated environmental scientists. So they are coming at the world from a Newtonian perspective. And obviously when the universe kind of graces you with this hyper spiritual child, you're like, wait a minute. I mean, what she's seeing is undeniably um, there, you know, cause like, for example, they had a friend who came over once when I was real little and I kept talking about the fact that I was seeing these problems around him and he you know, he went to the doctor and found out he had prostate cancer. So my parents were getting this direct feedback of like, well, there's something really seriously real going on with this child, but to what degree is this a gift and to what degree is this illness, right? I mean, we live in this world where most of our mystics are locked up in institutions by a certain age because it's so difficult to deal with if you don't have a whole group of individuals that know exactly how to work somebody into you know, being able to deal with this plethora of information that they're receiving all the time, then it's very difficult to manage. So, well, and, and if you've, to be fair as well, if you've never experienced that, then how could you even know what it's like? Yeah. Except to call it insanity. Exactly. So in my childhood, you, you watched this pattern with my parents of going back and forth between kind of letting me dabble in, you know, the things that I was, you know, talking about and, dragging me around from psychologist to psychiatrist to try to figure out what the hell is going on with me. And all of that, you know, would have been bad enough, but I was targeted in my youth by a, a child predator. And that target happened specifically because of my spiritual gifts. So when I um, grew up and ran away from that situation, I wanted nothing to do with spiritual anything nothing to do with helping people with any of the stuff that I saw. I wanted to just become totally physical. So I became a professional athlete and it wasn't until, you know, I really realized that I'm running away from who I am in this and it's not going anywhere. You know, I'm the one at the starting gate there, you know, for a ski race, looking over at, you know, my fellow competitors just watching all kinds of dynamics, like their dead father trying to communicate with them at the starting line. And 
So I'm like, you know, <laughs> as one this does, <laughs> this isn't going to work for me long term. So um, I, I basically I got to this point after I had my son where I was like, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep I can't keep running away from who I am and teach him to embrace himself. So I started seeing people one on one. And it wasn't until, you know, really in my adult life that I started seeing people one on one that I was realizing the amount of information that I had that other people didn't have. And as you know, probably when you have a gift, you really take it for granted, you know? Yeah. And you think like, everyone else sees the same stuff. Well, I was, I wasn't, I wasn't there anymore because in my, you know, early years, obviously you, you already had those experiences, but I, I had the same, you know, I could see the future. Um, I had an experience where I was in South Korea. My girlfriend was driving home from Utah to Nebraska, and I saw her crash a car nine hours before it happened in a dream. And the detail of that crash was very vivid, and I could even see the license plate. I'd never seen the car before and how she fell asleep at the wheel. And all of it happened nine hours later, exactly as I had dreamt. Uh -huh. So I knew that there were certain things that, People didn't see, but I thought that my way of reasoning and logic around my universe around me was pretty normal, let's say like middle of the road type of thing. It took me a long time to figure out that I saw the world entirely differently than virtually everybody else. And that was like a big epiphany for me. I was like in a pharma, you know, executive committee meeting one day and I'm like, these people don't think like me. <laughs> that's a very familiar feeling i know that feeling so but yours must have been when like you said when um, you're actually seeing you know spirits or whatever extra extra dimensional phenomenon and then like you said at the track i mean did you tell people about it or did you just kind of perceive it quietly at what point in my life at when you were like a teenager Oh, no, like at that point, I was trying to keep everything secret from everybody around me. Wow. Um, while at the same time being drug around to cult rituals by this man and deliberately being used as access to these other dimensional places. Wow. Yeah. I developed a real adverse relationship with it. <laughs> now, what was the, so what were these cult rituals, if you are comfortable saying? So, well, they involved child sacrifice. Many of them, it depends on which holiday throughout the year. Um, a lot of them were, were blood rite rituals. A lot of them were where you essentially use a body as a carrier to invoke demonic entities um, that then you mate with. So they're sexual rite rituals. And was this um, somehow related to, you know, some of the local religions or one religion in particular? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I never, I, I mean, I guess this would have been the shadow side of Mormonism I never experienced and saw. I only joined Mormonism when I was 17, and I was in it for like 10 years. Okay. And I did it all for a girl, which was like, you know, every <laughs> every major mistake in my life has been somehow involving a woman. And um, that, that's that's a whole pathology. But, um, <laughs> but I never, I never saw that side of it. There were there, certainly aspects of the culture and everything that I definitely found problematic on many levels. And I, I left the Mormon church, but, um, but I never saw anything like what you've experienced. A lot of that is because they're, you know, I, I think the average Mormon who's just going to church, trying to follow, you know, the doctrine as much as they can, they're largely unaware of some of these other things that are going on. Yeah. Um, that are spinoffs of their church, nor would they stand for them if they found out. But there's a real dark underbelly that's going on um, in even the mainstream churches, some of them. I do believe that. I think all religion in general seeks kind of cult status in a way. And, well, so and government does too, by the way. But I, I think all these institutional aspects are, are things that I, I hope will start to see dissolve in you know coming iterations in the future if we're going to talk about the the mainstream religion of mormonism the big problem that i see is that it seeks to like so many religions severely suppress aspects of human nature yeah. and whenever you suppress aspects of human nature you end up with this it's basically an inability to suppress it right 
And so it starts to bubble up in these strange ways, which is why you see the highest porn subscription rate in Provo, Utah, and like one of the highest prescription you know, medication um, rates here in Utah as well. You can't suppress these things. And so, you know, the, the, the sort of, uh, let's call it the darker aspects of the human psyche or, you know, lust and things like that, they come up and they are expressed in these very covert ways. Now, we've seen that with the Catholic Church, right? And what was happening between the priests and, you know, a lot of the children that were involved there. And it is happening definitely within the Mormon Church. But the important part to understand about my childhood is that way back in the early days of, of the church, right, there are these inflection points or deflection points. Well, basically these points where pressure is put on the Mormon church um, to change certain things about what they're doing, right? So we saw that happen with polygamy. Yeah. And so you've got the group that broke off called the FLDS. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what are you guys doing turning your back on you know, essentially what it is that we believe. So there's a whole group that practices polygamy still and not just polygamy. I mean, they're very much more adhering to the original doctrine for the, you know, in the Book of Mormon. So there's another spinoff group. There's actually several, but there's another spinoff group that even Mormons themselves are not aware of because of the, some of the things that they're doing. They call themselves the Blood Covenant. Now, I've, he I've, heard, I've heard of this. Is this also... It was kind of highlighted in this television show, I think, on it was Hulu or something called Under the Banner of Heaven. Yes. I watched that show, and that, like, freaked me out. i got to be okay. honest. I was like, this was not the Mormon church I was a member of. So Yeah, so that's the one that I was around. And wow. my parents were not a part of this. I was pulled into it separately. So I'll tell you, the reason that why that whole thing happened is that the Blood Covenant, they got really fixated on a lot of the original teachings of Brigham Young. Now, when Brigham Young brought the Mormons over to Utah, he was talking a lot about this concept of blood atonement, which is that there are some sins which are not paid for by the blood of man or by the blood of Christ, right? So they have to be paid for by the blood of man. So a lot of most Christian faiths essentially believe that when Christ died, he essentially yeah. atoned for mm -hmm. all man's sins. Now, this grace. group is like, no, 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 no. This, this group is like, no, there are some sins which must be paid for by the blood of man that is not paid for by the blood of Christ and his death on the cross. And so they believe that it's their direct job to essentially spill the blood of those who need atonement. And so there is all these teachings when he first came to Utah about how important it was to keep your brethren in line. So um, like if, if you caught somebody that you, like a friend of yours committing adultery or something like that, if thou lovest him, thou shall kill him. So th this group believes in blood atonement, and they believe it's their direct job to rid the earth of evil. It's a, it's a completely different mentality than turn the other cheek, right? So yeah. most Mormons in mainstream religion are like, you know, just sort of stick to the path. And like, if you get tempted off the path, just turn your cheek. But this group is like, no, no, no. Our job is to keep each other in check. Now, this obviously, ideologies like this open the door for people who have, you know, criminal pathology. It's a place for them to exercise what it is that they're already dealing with inside. And so you get a lot of deviants that enter into groups like this, specifically as a way to canvas, you know, the things that they're dealing with psychologically. Wow, and that, that was the so case with this, you know, that was the case with the man who ended up targeting me. So the reason that I was targeted is because the Mormons believe in the gifts of priesthood. So they believe in the ability to like see and talk to spirits and the ability to, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. take God's power and baptize. But that's something that women cannot do. So they teach that, that women, your version of priesthood is the ability to bring forth life. Isn't that going to be fun for you? But so if a woman is exhibiting these types of gifts, they believe that it was a gift of the devil. And that was a very serious thing in the 80s in the incredibly secular town, which I was raised in so. so which town were you raised in can i ask yeah the, so i was raised in the middle of the wilderness in between logan utah and garden city uh, utah which is i mean they're both just so insanely mormon it's like i might as well have been born in mecca <laughs> <laughs> you're by, yeah. by the way I, I know you're right on that because i i used to live in utah i went to college at byu and you know which was also insanely mormon but probably more the mainstream Mormon. We didn't have, I, I never even, I had never even seen an FLDS member until like five years ago. Like I, like, I don't know where I was like, what the heck? Like I was in happy Valley, I guess. 
in in this part of Utah that we never even saw a polygamist or anything. And then I was in Provo visiting my daughter who lived in American Fork, American Fork, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but you didn't think we we're going to talk about Utah so much, but you know, you know, it's kind of a thing. But I was in like some restaurant, and the, all these FLDS people came in, and I was like, "What?" And I had just seen the whole Sister Wives show, and once I sat on the plane next to the guy with the weird hair that was on Sister Wives show, right, kind of trying to channel Brigham Young with the beard and no mustache and yeah. all that stuff, and and I was like, "What? This actually exists? Are you kidding me?" Oh, yeah. I, mean, I knew about it in like the border of Arizona and Utah where they have these houses with like nine kitchens for each of your nine wives. And then you kind of just like jump to the other side of the house to evade the police when they come. Yeah. Weird stuff like that. But I didn't even know about this other blood covenant stuff until I saw it on, on this program. And now it makes a lot of sense with your story. But I hadn't even connected those two. So this is like beyond fascinating for me. <laughs> Because, you know, I've talked about this with my, my daughter, who also left the Mormon church. And, you know, I think quitmormon.org is probably like one of the biggest Google searches right now whenever you look up Mormonism. Yeah. And, and so this definitely is, is an issue. And, and, and even the mainstream, by the way, it sounds to me like you're de dealing with differing layers of repressions. Yes. Of the shadow. And the shadow consciousness comes out. So one of the things that we see in, in mainstream Mormonism all the time the two things they judge the most are money and sex. Well, and that's ironic, isn't it? Isn't that ironic? Because here, the, the 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 back flip side of that repression is, oh, well, you can't have sex, you know, premarital sex. But if you do it under the covenant, then you can have as many wives as you want and just go crazy, right? And then the other aspect of this shadow revealing itself is multi-level marketing of people trying to, you know, get rich quick. I can't, I can't tell you how many times in my Mormon life, people showed up at my door and said, you know, we want to pitch you on Amway or one of these multi-level marketing things. And then they'd show up and they'd put a video in the TV and they'd, they'd always start off with a boat. And they'd say, don't you want a boat? Oh. Don't you want to get rich with a boat? And I'm like, what the hell is with the boat? I don't get why it's always a boat. Well, because it was that excess. It was representation of excess of what it's like, whether it's new skin or you name it, any one of these things. And so I always laughed. I'm like, this is when I started realizing that all of these things were just shadows that were being repressed and then projecting in different ways in the outside world. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. But I, it's like we're sidestepping the fact that this is the richest church on earth. I know. And and exactly. That is the biggest thing as well. What a what a hypocrisy. Right. So it's like it's it's worth, you know, last I saw some crazy number. It's well over a hundred billion dollars. Oh, I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Uh, I don't I don't know the exact values on it today. I know it's very, very wealthy. Oh, you should go look it up. You You literally can't even compare them next to other religions you have to you have to put them up against the biggest corporations which many of which they own by the way um on earth it's really fascinating so so do you really believe that this is some sort of collective shadow for the you know it's, it's like i think a lot of your work deals with dealing with the shadow and and being able to transmute those aspects and when you start to learn to accept your shadow then a lot of those things just kind of dissipate and go away Mm -hmm. When you, the more you repress it, the more it comes out in these twisted manifestations. Yep. And yep. It, that's about maybe the best example I can, I've directly witnessed um, of shadow repression leading to really bizarre outcomes, especially around money and sex. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, but every, almost every mainstream religion is on, is on the shopping blocks there. I mean, this is, this is the human condition and it has been for thousands of years, which I'm seeking to change here, is the idea that you've got to figure out what's bad and wrong about you, suppress, deny, reject, and disown it, and muscle yourself into, you know, siding with whatever righteousness is for your specific culture. It's never worked. It's a terrible formula, but we continue to do it. So how did you escape? So before we go off of, you know, this in between Logan, Utah, and, you know, BF, BF Utah, right? It's like, <laughs> what, how did you escape this? The cult group? Yeah. 
Oh. Eh, well, I actually legitimately ran. Um, I mean, the story of what was going on with those cult groups is a lot smaller than the story of what was going on with me and this this one specific man in my childhood life. And he he miscalculated a lot of the stuff that he was doing in my teen years. And one day ended up miscalculating a dose of ketamine. So I was supposed to lose consciousness when I, and I didn't. And because of not losing consciousness, I was able to essentially see him in the process of what we call programming. When I was able to witness him in the process of programming, it made me you know, realize, well, if he's lying to me about this, what else has he lied to me about? It didn't feel good. It wasn't like that realization was like, oh my gosh, I'm free. It's like your whole universe is just cracking and collapsing at your feet. And it was just this very instinctual impulse. I have to run away. So I got in my car and I, I drove like three hours away from where we were to the home of a man who I'd met only twice. And I broke into his house and I was like really torn. I'm like, I got to go back. You know, cause there's consequences, major consequences for every movie you make. So, you know, I wasn't actually planning on fully running away. It was like so instinctual. But when he came home and, and found me, he you know, you know realized what was going on with me. He was like, don't ever go back. And, and so I was like, no, I'll go back eventually. But like, you know, two days turns to three days, turns to a week. Now you're in huge trouble. Turns to I'm, now I'm hiding. Turns to I never want to go back. Turns to now I have to talk to the you know police and tell them everything that's been going on. And now all of a sudden, you know, the address on my ID is the police station itself. And I'm legitimately in hiding for a while. How, okay, with... <laughs> I, I can imagine these people, you, you're you're probably like their poster child for everything that goes wrong amongst their cult, right? So you stayed in Utah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many days. Well, I have a place in Costa Rica, but there is there's so many days when I think about this. A lot of that is down to, to this. Um, when I, I had no life skills, okay. Like you don't when your whole life is an abuse situation. So the only you thing you were like could, 18, 19 at this stage, or I was 19. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I did know how to do was to ski, right? My father is an incredibly expert skier. So he was dragging me around the slope since I was, you know, that big. So I knew how to ski. And the only thing I could think of to not want to kill myself every day was to go to the ski slopes. And so I was like, well, I can't just ski for fun all day long. I got to actually make some sort of money out of this. So I started, I, I got really interested in racing and eventually made the, the U.S. Telemark racing team. Really? And at that point, the entire racing team was up in Whitefish, Montana. So I'm like, yay, I'm getting out of Utah. And then they tell me, no, actually, this year we're going to do an experiment. We're going to stick a male and a female from our team with the Alpine team in, in Utah, in Park City, Utah. And I'm like, no. <laughs> So they send me to Park City, Utah, and it took me one day, one day in this place. And I was like, this is the most amazing town ever. It is. I fell in love. It's like an oa oasis in Utah. Yep. Exactly. So then, so then I'm doing the professional sports things. You don't do a professional winter sport without living in Park City, Utah. This is where every professional athlete is. So then you have, you know, you do that and then you meet somebody to have kids with them. And then all of a sudden it's like, you're in Utah too. You know? <laughs> You know, that was the thing. When I went to your event, and thank you for the invitation. It was very kind of you. I sat in the front row in the middle seat, and I was really struck by how funny you are. You have a really great sense of humor that doesn't always come across in all your very kind of super intense shadow integration type videos and such. And I think for anybody who hasn't been to, you know, one of your direct in-person events, that was one of the best things to, to learn about about you. Is you have a really funny sense of humor. Yeah. Well, I mean, if we're not making fun of this whole process, we're going to die. Like this is, it's too much. The process of awakening is too much. If you don't develop some kind of sense of humor about yourself and about the world and about these patterns. Yeah. Wow. So you, okay. So you finally, you, I mean, at that point you're 19 years old or close to 20, probably at this stage, or maybe even more than 20. And you thought you were going to go to whitefish. You ended up going to park city. You fell in love with park city. And then it's like, you just stayed. Yeah. And and there you are. And then you became like a, a spiritual guru. Yeah. 
I mean, fill the gap in between there. The gap in between there is that um, I ended up having to switch sports because uh, all of our sponsors were lost for, for U.S. Telemark. Um, so I switched to actually speed skating, and I was a long track speed skater. And I was putting myself into premature menopause. Basically, there are two doctors that were like, you know, because I, I went for backup checks. I'm like, I don't believe one doctor. No, it was like unanimous. These doctors are like, we got problems. If you're going to continue down this path, like it's very probable that you will never be able to jumpstart your fertility again. Speed skating is out of this universe. It is unlike any sport I have ever done or any, ever encountered. It's a long distance, but also a plyometric sport. You are, you are literally working out six to eight hours a day. And I'm talking like high intensity stuff. It's so intense that at nighttime I was getting fevers every night just because of the amount of exercise I was doing. Jeez. So they're like, obviously I'm having to monitor you all the time. And like, you know, I was really put in this position of you're, you're going to choose between an Olympic career, which you want and having a baby. And that was a big deal for me because in my childhood, the, you know, the man who had me when I was younger, he got me pregnant three times in my teen years and forced the abortions himself. Wow. And that it ruins you. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, it does something to your soul. It's like, it's like a mental tick. Like you can't, you can't have it not happen successfully once. So that was a very big crossroads for me. And I chose having a child. And when, I mean, everybody who has children that, that's connected understands what I mean when it's like that child is born and your whole life is changed. I mean, completely changed you're like you're now it's not about you anymore you're looking at the world in terms of what about what am i going to teach this child how am i going to be an example yeah you know for what i'm looking for and you know my son was born with this crystalline auric field it looks prismatic right and those of us who are in in these other dimensions understand what that means i do um the crystal auric field is they're like the ultimate healers and I, I was bummed for a, a hot minute there because I was like, you know what? Here I am sort of mentally fantasizing that I'm going to have this jock for a son, you know, who's who's going to be not suffering like I'm suffering. That was what it was all about. You know, this kid's not going to suffer like me. Mm -hmm. Oh, hell no. No, the universe is like, here's another spiritual child. You're a sensitive one. I'm like, no, no, no. So, you know, first I'm like, I'm good. He's going to suffer like I suffered. He's going to suffer like I suffered. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to be able to change that about him. And I can't teach him how to live in this world with these, you know, any of these gifts that he might come in with or any of the sensitivities if I'm not completely able to do that myself, which is what turned me back in the direction of this. Wow. Wow. Okay. So now how old were you when you, when you had your son? 25. 25. And so from that point forward, when did you start? So, I mean, that would have been about the same time that you started posting videos on social media. And, and I wrote YouTube. my first book when he was eight months old. I wrote it during his naps. I mean, like you can picture me putting him down for his naps and mm -hmm. just writing. And it was very shortly after I, I published that first book that I got frustrated that I was not able to reach enough people. What it was is I was seeing people one-on-one -on -one and I was realizing that the amount of information that I had about the greater universe and like the mental and emotional patterns that are going on in their relationships and in their lives. I mean, for me, that's just, it's like, what color is the wall? Blue. I mean, it's that simple. So I was talking to them and realizing they weren't seeing a lot of this stuff. And if they did, their lives would be transformed. And that created a real frustration. It's almost like a wake up moment. You're like, wait a minute, the whole universe is just walking around with blinders on and they're suffering their asses off because of it. So I'm like, I can't, I can't do that. Like I have to be able to like reach people, but there's a real frustration with that because obviously most people can't afford, you know, the amount of money to go pay, you know, a practitioner for a session. And I can't see the whole world. So I was wanting that message out. So I'm like, how, 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 how? And it was at this time when YouTube was just this place for party tricks, mostly, you know, <laughs> It was just entertainment. It was basically like America's Funniest Home Videos, but online. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I don't know. This is a major risk to think about whether people are actually going to want information or whether it's going to be like, you know, three views and 1,700 dislikes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm like, I got to take the risk. And I, so I did. I had like hung a sheet up. It's so embarrassing at this point. God, I had this crappy camcorder. I hung this like bed sheet up behind me 
And I just started answering people's questions. The questions that I knew that they wanted to hear. Things like, you know, what is a ghost? Things like how to raise your vibration. And I'm telling you, my, my career, once I did that, was like absolute wildfire. Really? Yeah. It's been, in fact, much more of a struggle in the era of, you know, social media picking up to the point where now everybody can sort of be an influencer. Yeah. Now it's more of a frustrating struggle of, of like working with SEO and, you know, making sure that the marketing, you know, companies can reach people because otherwise they won't see it. But in the beginning, it wasn't like that at all. It was literally just organic grassroots, everybody sharing, everybody flipping out about it. Me all of a sudden getting invited all over the world to different places and have, sort of having that moment where I'm like, oh no, you know, my whole stay at home mom thing is over, isn't it? You know? <laughs> wow. How did you feel about that? I mean, that must've been kind of exciting on the one hand, but also like, wait, do I really want to do all this? My personality isn't real conducive to staying at home with children, but it was heartbreaking. And I, you know, I'm not really one to blow smoke up people's bums when it's not the reality. I, I think honestly, one of the worst parts of my entire life has been having to balance motherhood with having a giant international career. It is a nightmare. I, you know, when, when women do this thing where they get up on stages and they talk about the fact that you can do everything, I think it's complete BS. Me too. So it was hard. It was really, 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 really hard. Notice men never say that. Or it's very rare. I've never heard a man. I mean, Elon Musk might try, but I mean, everybody knows there's no way he's going to be a really good, you know, yeah. be stay at home dad or even around dad. I, I just can't, can't even imagine that. And so this whole idea that I think often people, particularly the, of the female gender, have this notion of this expectation is I have to do it all. Yeah. I, I want to come back to that because that is such a big aspect because I think it also leads to a lot of disappointment, dissatisfaction, suffering yeah. on the part of the feminine. It also leads to the breakdown of relationships. I mean, oh, 100%, yep. it's such a powerful, it's a powerful aspect of, of shadow again and lack of integration and not feeling enough. And so yeah. they keep telling themselves that they have this higher expectation and higher and higher. It's like, you'll never feel enough. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you want me to dive in with this one? Or dive what straight else? in. Cause I know you're, you are a veritable expert in this and, and you come from it from a different perspective because you are a woman that has really, you know, could arguably say you, you are doing many, many, many things. Oh, it's insane. It's insane. Like you, you've got so much <laughs> stuff going on. And I remember when I first started watching you, I was like, you know what? This is probably one of those things like for me, probably five years from now, someone's going to say, oh, I started watching your videos, Robert, and you awaken me is probably going to be like someone like Barack Obama or something like that, right? Who's going to, and I'm going to be like, what? Are you kidding me? Right? Well, for me, when I started watching your videos, I wanted to, at one point, I remember thinking, you know what? Because I went to ASU for grad school. And I went to a school called Thunderbird for business school. That's part of ASU now. And, and I was like, um, oh, maybe I'll just go back to visit because there's some alumni thing going on. And I'll try to, I figure, I thought for some reason you must live in Sedona, like this crystal capital of the world, right? And I thought maybe, maybe I'll look up Teal Swan and go ask her some questions. <laughs> I love that. So funny. But I didn't know you lived in Utah. And at that time, I was going back and forth to Utah because my daughter used to live there for a long time and uh, attack this topic of expectations and self and shadow and, and how, you know, we all accumulate this shadow. And it's funny because you said the wall behind me is blue, but immediately I was also thinking, well, it just so happens to be somewhat of a magenta color on the other side. But the thing that's interesting about your wall there, you may not even know is that blue color that you have there, right. Is also, the absorption of that blue, we're looking at the reflection, but it's absorption is the red mm -hmm. and it's both. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like how I see shadow and light because I don't believe coming from a more physics perspective and mathematics background, I look at it more as the light is not, you know, so we have light, we have darkness and darkness is not the absence of light, but rather to me, it's the opposite condition of light. 
So absorption is a thing. And darkness is not the absence of light. It's just its opposite condition because black is the absorption of white. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Where do you want me to spin off from that? Jump right in. How do we form our shadows? How does our shadow get formed from our, our, our persona separating out? How does the shadow get there and how does it accumulate through our lifetimes? Okay, well, we're working with semantics right now because when we use the word shadow, all we really mean is that it is not in the conscious mind. So we compare, you can kind of compare the, the subconscious to dark and the conscious mind to light. That's just mm -hmm. been like an analogy that's been used for so many hundreds of years at this point that it's, it's like if you're not kind of on the bandwagon a little bit, nobody knows what you're talking about. Okay, so when we say the shadow, we mean the unconscious, that which you are unconscious of. Now, let's play a little game here. Tell me something that you know really well. Like you said, mathematics, for example, right? I know mathematics pretty well. Okay, so you know that you know mathematics. Tell me something you don't know. Something I don't know in general? Mm -hmm. Ice skating. So we're still in the realm of what you know. We're still in the realm of conscious. Yeah, so, so unconscious. what I don't know is I don't, the things I, I don't know that I don't know. Yes. What is you don't the unconscious. Know, you don't know is the unconscious. Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of, I mean, you could say that a person is born with a certain degree of unconsciousness, right? So some of that we come in with, but a lot of it we add to over the course of our, our process of socialization. So the bulk of when we're talking about the subconscious or talking about the shadow side, the bulk of what we're talking about is that which is suppressed, denied, rejected, and disowned, and therefore goes slips into that element of the, the psyche that we would call the unconscious. Um, By the way, I would give that even a possible scientific name, entropy. <laughs> entropy is not, you know, I, I often, I, I make and developed a random number generator, right? So I make randomness, but I don't really believe in randomness. I believe that randomness is the word we use for those things we just cannot perceive the encryption that's underlying it because it's too large. And that encryption is basically the boundary of our where our knowledge ends and our ignorance begins. And I, when I say ignorance, I don't mean just ignorance like I don't know ice skating. It's the definition that you just gave, which is I don't know what I don't know. Yeah. And that's entropy. Well, good, that. <laughs> there you go. So now you have some scientific terms. And, and actually, the analogy you just gave as well about the um, conscious mind and then the unconscious or the subconscious. And I want to try to split hairs between unconscious, how you see unconscious versus subconscious as well, because sometimes they're used synonymously, sometimes they're totally not. I'd love to hear your thought on that. But my approach to it, which is absorption reflection, right? Absorption reflection also actually works in that context as well, because the unconscious is not without structure. It's just not known to us, yep. right? And it's, it's literally this absorption versus the reflection, the reflection being the illuminated in our illuminated consciousness. And the other part of it, it's just unknown to us, but it still has structure. It still has some coherence. But the conscious mind is profoundly receptive. There is a, there's a huge absorption element to the conscious mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, subconscious mind the subconscious mind also has this element of, of, I, instead of reflection, it's more like deflection and projection. <laughs> projection for sure. Projection for sure. And and so a lot of your work and a lot of mine as well is about how to merge those two realms together into bringing awareness. And that's how consciousness, I believe, expands. But yes. how, do you delineate between subconscious and unconscious? Unconscious? If I do, it's 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 just the I mean what, the two words have like a very subtle flavor difference. It's not I'm not the kind of person who splits hairs between the two. You might use I see me use them interchangeably. I right? do too, actually. That's why, and I get questioned about it all the time, and so then I'm like, well, I guess I kind of use them interchangeably, but I just want to see if you feel yeah, the same way. I feel the same yeah, way. I feel that way. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So keep going. So you're saying that you've got this part of us that's the conscious mind. Yeah. That is the known and and the aspect that we we know, but we may not be skilled at, right? But, you know, one of my favorite quotes is by Schopenhauer, which is talent is being able to hit a target that other people can't hit. But genius is being able to hit a target that other people can't see. 
And to me, that says something, again, about uh, moving more towards a balance of being able to have expanded consciousness through connecting to this other unconscious world. Yes. So keep going, please. <laughs> I don't know where to go with that. Um, should we t so uh, something that people need to understand, I think, about the subconscious is that it's not all negative stuff buried down in there. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of what I like call uh, shadow gold, where we've suppressed and nine disowned pretty wonderful things. When I'm working with a person, I'm I'm much more interested in working with how the, the process of socialization causes them to essentially fill in the content of their subconscious mind, because that's what ca is causing the majority, vast majority of pain in someone's life. If you want, my overall goal here is to find an answer to suffering and to provide it to the people. So obviously most of my focus is on the process of socialization, which is really the root of suffering for humans on this earth. Mm -hmm. So when I say socialization, what I mean is when you come into a, a group, like a group species, which we all do, you learn that your entire survival is dependent upon these individuals. And so you need to find a way to endear yourself to those individuals. And we are growing in a society that believes in punishment and reward. Um, there's real consequences for us not being liked. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that when we come into our specific family and our specific culture, we very much want to find alignment with the things that they believe are acceptable and right and good. And we very much want to gain that alignment by pushing away from ourselves. Yeah. Things that are seen as, as not good, you know, bad, wrong. The problem is, is that by doing that, we can do this really. I mean, it's, it's not a, we may think that we can uh, separate ourselves from these aspects of ourselves, but we actually can't. Mm -hmm. All we do is sort of stuff them into the subconscious mind, right? Well, and um, they kind of pop up in the world around us, and then we judge it all the time. Yeah. So it's obvious that, I mean, you could think, let's say that you're born into a family, and in that family, um, violence of any kind is not acceptable. You don't get to have it be part of you. You're going to take the aspect of you that has, you know, a, a tendency towards violence, and you're going to suppress, deny, and disown that aspect of yeah. yourself. And then it's free to come out in all of these subconscious ways. Mm -hmm. But to the opposite, so that would be considered like a negative or a painful uh, thing that you've suppressed in the subconscious. But the same thing happens with, you know, things like aptitudes. So let's say that you're born into a family that's really super scientific, but you're like an incredible artist, but they don't value that. In fact, all you're getting as feedback is like, why don't you do something useful with your time? You can't make money with art, you know? <laughs> you're you're going to potentially, when you're very young, start to suppress you know, the artist within yourself. So that happened that's to me. I mean, it did? <laughs> I was a musician who suppressed my musical abilities because I felt the world didn't value it. And I wouldn't even tell people that I was a musician, oh. even though I had full ride scholarships and everything for it. I, I, after I came back from being a Mormon missionary, can you believe this? <laughs> from South Korea, I came back and I'm like, okay, I got to get serious now. Music's got to go. Damn. Now it came back in a major way. It never really left me. It was just I had to finally go through my life crisis to reconnect with that musical aspect of me. And it's been one of the, now I'm a music theorist, which is like, what? See, See, so you've, it you've never goes away. Hand, that's a firsthand experience of shadow gold. That is shadow gold. You're exactly yeah. right. It's just the things that we felt ashamed of. We didn't want other people to know about, or maybe we felt was a vulnerable aspect of us. And yep. so we separate ourselves from it and say, I'm not that. Yep. But everything we see in this world, I now know is actually, I am that. I yes. am. Yep. That's the most advanced. That's actually the practice of love. The real practice of love is to take all things in existence as a part of the self. And when I say that, I need people to understand that you can't just decide to do that overnight. Like tr love is a choice, but that choice will be the most difficult practice you have ever tried to do. Ever. It is, it is literally the top of the top mastery. Wow. So how, how do you do that? Because that also relates to the socialization aspect and relationships. <laughs> well, you start with understanding. I, I almost want people to take the word love and to drop it off a cliff for a little bit. Because understanding is really the genesis of the sensation or the experience or the choice of love. We have to choose to understand everything. That means, let's say that you've got this, and especially what we resist. So you've got this huge resistance to... Let's say, you know, people who, who like pedophiles. 
I have that resistance. Okay. <laughs> you just nailed it. Wait, you're not jumping in my consciousness, are you, right now? <laughs> that was pretty epic. <laughs> Watching you do that on stage as well. So, okay, so I do have an aversion to pedophiles, and it's one of those things that, and to be honest with you, the more I judge pedophiles, the more it showed up everywhere in the media all around me. Mm -hmm. Until finally I was like, okay, I, I just shouldn't get triggered by it. I, I need to kind of like not get angry and triggered every time I hear the word almost. And I well, noticed it started to dissipate the amount of things that came up about pedophilia. It just didn't show up in my field as much. Okay. I don't know where to go from there because when people say I shouldn't feel a certain way. I know that's another repression, right? Yeah, it is. So, so if you've got this, <laughs> so if you've got this aversion to something like mm -hmm. pedophiles, let's just take this as an example. You need to first have a complete goal to understand them totally. So this should be the beginning of the sort of research phase. I want to understand them as if I was one. As if I was one, all right? Now, people fear that when they do this, they're suddenly going to, it's like they're going to lose all personal control and become that. And that's not what happens. Quite the opposite, in fact, because it's not like you lose the aspect of you that has a no to that, right? What happens is you release resistance, the, the resistance you have over here, you still have this truth that you don't want to be doing that, right? And then you're able to approach this whole issue from a completely different perspective. Like you can't work with serial killers when you've got this hell no to serial killers, right? Yeah. You can't work with let's go even like underneath that because people still have a very hard time with this and they still want to be like no there's there's hell no's okay but let's say that let's say that you have um let's say that you have acne right you don't want to go to a doctor who's like no 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 you know you want to go to somebody who's like oh i i have so much understanding for this yeah. that i'm not a no for for mm -hmm. you and what you're dealing with it's almost like a Yes, and let's look at it and let's deal with it and let's work through it, right? right? So that lack of resistance is what enables us to actually have the you know, all the information so as to take effective action towards whatever it is that we're, you know, focusing at. I like the way you said release the resistance because that's kind of what I felt like I did. I released the resistance of it, but I didn't, I, I got to be honest, I didn't go into, I tried to go into a little bit the mind empathetically of what is it that, you know, drives uh, someone who is a pedophile. And it's been showing up a lot in society, right? Oh, a yeah. lot. And, and, and so I started thinking, because I don't look at my world as a universe as much as I feel like it's a you inverse. So all the things that I repress and don't like about myself, I notice they pop up in the world around me. And I attract everything I judge until I stop judging everything I attract. <laughs> see, see how you turned a pharma CEO into like a freak. <laughs> I love that. Okay. So step two for this is that obviously when you've got like a strong trigger, what that essentially means is that at some point in your, your life, you ran into a serious pain around a subject and you did not actually fully feel it. Yes. With feelings, you have to actually let it resound through your entire being until it itself leaves. See, feelings move, right? And if we don't allow them to move, they get stuck in our tissues. So another way to approach this is that when you've, when you've got that strong trigger around a pedophile, you close your eyes, you focus all of your attention on the way that that feels and not trying to do anything with it. We call this somatic journey work, right? So when you do that, you're going to start to see textures and you're going to start to see colors and you know, you're going to be very, very attuned to the sensations that are occurring within your body with your focus, just looking at it. I mean, with that level of intensity, what's happening is your conscious mind is working through that pattern. So that pattern, maybe it starts like this, when you start to focus on it, it starts to shake apart and then all of a sudden it changes and you're essentially following it the whole time that it changes. This may take several hours, depending on whatever pattern a person has, but you will end up going through an entire like journey work experience where you end up at the end with some kind of a, a resolution state embodied. 
And that is something that people don't usually do with their triggers, right? We're usually trying to find a way to get rid of triggers. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's another way that we can approach this. And and that oftentimes it's, it's very different than seeking the information and going to understand it. It's we're sitting with the emotion and we have insights that then bubble up from the bottom. So you have a very... Doing this process, you get a very uh, strong felt perception of what we mean when we say inner knowing. Like the answers are internal. It is pretty bizarre. Like out of yeah. nowhere, they just boom, mm -hmm. boom. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. So true. Yeah. So, so then how does this apply to the types of people that we attract in our relationships? Oh, are they... this impression thing? Yeah. Oh, I hate this conversation. Can I tell you why I hate this conversation? Because everybody wants to just believe in, in sort of, you know, the in love thing that there's a person out there that you're going to feel that heart racing sensation about. And that means you're, you know, a soulmate and you're meant to be together. The, and it sounds like it triggers you. <laughs> you know what, what it, what it is, is that I, I've realized that I've become so hated for this, for telling the truth about the complicated truth about attraction, for example. So tell it here. I want to hear it. I, I like the complicated truth. I really, I want people to be happy. So I really hate bursting their bubble, even though I know that happiness, the greater happiness is on the other side. Okay, here it is. So whenever we suppress, deny, and disown an aspect of self into the subconscious, we, we polarize, mm -hmm. right? So let's say that I suppress, deny, and reject and disown the aspect of me that's really um, angry. And I polarize all the way over to, I just don't know what it is. I just like, like anger is not really a thing that I feel. Um, I get really sad though. Like, let's say that I've polarized in that way, right? Polarity is the essence of attraction. We know this, you know, when we look at magnets, right? So what that means is that in my external reality, I'm going to be a match to whatever I suppress. And not only a match to it, because you're a match also to what you've, you know, to both extremes in your external. What it is, is that I'm only going to feel drawn towards whatever I did suppress. So likelihood is I'm going to be a person who's like, it was just magic in the beginning, but he's like a real rage monster. Oh. <laughs> totally. <laughs> okay. So basically, you know, the, the picture of attraction is so incredibly complicated because it includes things like what we suppress tonight, this own. It includes things like, you know, these agendas of what we need to heal because of our childhood experience and, and therefore going towards, you know, people who remind us of our parents so that we can try to get our parent to love us, but through this new person who's exhibiting the exact same behavior. Um, it involves elements of, of familiarity in our definition of home. So you may be like, oh, I just really like that person. Yeah, why? Because it's so familiar for you to be in that type of a dynamic that, you know, another person may walk into that and be like, Ugh, but you're like, oh, but I know exactly how to operate here. Yeah. Okay, so so like the picture of attraction and who we are, are gravitating towards as friends and who we're gravitating towards in terms of people we like. You know, I could even say this goes as far as, you know, the celebrity thing. Um, it definitely applies most strongly to who we are romantically inclined towards. It's a very complex picture that involves so many elements of things that we have suppressed, denied, and disowned and are not aware of. That telling the story, you know, I, I really just like this person because it's just how I feel is like, oh dear, you know? <laughs> so so what, what happens is I'm not like encouraging people to ignore the way that they feel. Because the way you feel is information. It's just, what is the information? And that's what people don't usually do. They don't usually take the way that they feel and then dissect the living hell out of it to be like, oh, I understand the elements of why I feel this way. Okay. So, so riddle me this. <laughs> um, so one thing that I've started to really think about is okay. in relationships. Um, you know, by the way, I've had several and... I, um, and I've been married three times. And so, you know, my people ask me a very difficult math question all the time. They say, you know, how much is a half of a half of a half? And I say three marriages. And that's the answer. Cause that's what happens to your money. So, oh, okay. <laughs> oh boy. 
So, so, but I start to think maybe the relationships that you come across, I, I do believe in this you inverse concept. So I, I look at the world as like, this is the inside out me, the world yep. around me, yes. because I can't separate my cognitive and conditioning biases from how I perceive the world. So it's my unique world. It's my unique world. Everyone's got their own unique way of seeing the world. So therefore it's a unique world for them. And all the people that I meet can be divine messages of things that I need to integrate. The lessons that I don't learn, I end up repeating over and over again yep. until I learn them. Yep. And, and so each time I've had a relationship with a woman, I need to clearly delineate that. Um, not that there's anything wrong with not being that, but just be sure. Um, each time I have, integrated another aspect of divine feminine into my consciousness. That's interesting. And each time it opened my heart in different ways. And sometimes it was, you know, I, I think it's, I don't know. Now I look at it, the heart never really truly breaks. It's the ego that does. Yeah. And the separation. Yep. So have you felt like in your relationships, and I'm not asking you about your relationships, but in general, in your relationships, um, have you felt like you picked up aspects of the divine masculine into your consciousness as a result of those relationships? No, not at all. That's why, no, that's why I was, I'm really interested in you in this being an observation that you've had for me, for your mm -hmm. relationships. Cause I, I have never actually heard another person say that. That, and you talk to a lot of people. Yeah. And you get them on stage and it's like pretty amazing how you do it. And yeah. you really needle like into them deep. Yeah. And but in a very kind way. It's 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 and even when they're kind of like sometimes there to be a hater, which was kind of strange and, and somewhat awkward to watch, to be honest. But like you handled it so like majestically. <laughs> Thank you. Seriously, so why why you've never heard that before? Is that such yeah. a surprise? Yeah, I've never heard this before. So, I, but I've, I'm interested as to what your actual experience was like. If you were going to break it down to some more, more minutia, you know, I've I I have been like your probably your archetypal in some ways man, in that I have had a a very successful and lucky life. Not that all men have lucky lives. I have been lucky. It's like. From the day I was born, I'm, I'm Taurus. I'm a Taurus. And I used to think, oh, my success is because I work hard and because, you know, I prepared well and I'm savvy and all these things. And, and of course, that leaves out all the negative aspects that got me there too, which is, can I be ruthless? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can I own that? Now I can. Before I couldn't. I'm like, I'm just the light. You know, this company sent me this package of stuff and they wanted to like, have me wear it on podcasts and stuff like that. I'm like, I'm not going to wear stuff on podcasts. It's like advertising. That's like, so not me. And, and so they, they sent me this hat that said light worker. And I'm like, okay, look, if you give me a hat that says shadow worker, maybe, maybe I'll wear it once. Right. Because everyone's like, I want to be the light. I want to be the light. Nobody wants to be the dark, but the dark has, as you said, shadow gold. Yeah. And so every relationship, even though they sometimes end ignominiously, I have learned something from and tried to integrate it in. Um, the last, you know, experience of this was a, a massive heart expansion. And the person was very, very empathetic. And I learned so much about empathy from that woman. Okay. Now I understand what you mean. Yeah. And it changed me. It really changed me. And to the point where I feel so much more deeply now than I ever did before. And, you know, I was, I, I it used to be, I could be very callous. Like I was in Rome a, about a month ago, right around the time of the October 7th thing that happened in Israel. And I just felt between that and then, you know, the counterattack that went into Gaza, I just felt like this terrible pain yep. and suffering in the world. And before I could have been a lot more callous and removed, but now because I'm irrevocably changed, my 
ability and capacity to feel has dramatically expanded. You must remind me to thank her. <laughs> she's pretty amazing. Mm. And she's a super fan of yours. So it's it's like I I have felt like I've integrated aspects of her and then the other relationships I've had as well. And each one has been a gift, truly a gift, even sometimes in the things that I thought were most painful and most triggering. When I could release the resistance to the trigger and then just ask myself, why did I choose this experience to learn from? Because I used to believe I was just an actor on the stage, and now I know I'm not just an actor. I'm a director, writer, producer, everything in this play of life. And I learned so much from my relationship. So my question for you is, have you felt that way ever to have learned something from a, a love relationship that you've had? Love, sorry. I use that swear word. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I would say that I've learned something from every single person that I've been with. Um, has it been worth the pain that I've experienced? Not really. Um, I, I'm experiencing something a little bit different than most people. Um, men tend to be hunters, is the honest truth. Yeah. And so a lot of them will go after women who they really want, you know, without any care to whether there's actual compatibility there, and that is a consistent trend so uh, it turns it very very quickly turns to a uh, psych i don't really want you it's like i wanted the, the character that i thought that i thought you would play and it's it's actually gotten worse since fame so, whoa that that's really deep teal that's super deep and i i feel i feel like a hurt from that yeah, this has got, it was already bad because I was a model before and anybody who's, anybody who's, you know, above a certain level of pretty experiences this thing where it's like, you don't exist. You're literally just what a person thinks you are. But I got famous and then it got 10 times worse because now, you know, people, men sort of see me as the universal mother they never had or the, you know, it's this universal muse. And so there's an expectation of the way that I'm going to be in relationship and it's wildly off what I'm actually like. So I, 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 you know what? I, I would have guessed that. You would have guessed that? I would have guessed that you're very different from what your most people would perceive of your public persona. Yeah. And it's, you know, what's interesting is it's, it's because in an interpersonal relationship with them, with a man, let's just say it's with a man, you know, we're not just talking about friendships. Let's just solely focus on romantic relationships. I definitely want to be a woman. I don't want to just be this sort of universal teacher. It's very different being in a relationship with an extraterrestrial, you know, being, you know, from another dimension than it is being in a relationship with a woman. So I think, you know, once I got into this, this, this field, there's very much the expectation that there is no humanity. Hmm. So it's been bad. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. I mean, so it's like, I guess the question I have for you is, who's your teal swan? Non-physical beings. <laughs> yeah. I don't have anybody embodied. I have friends in this business, but like, I don't, I don't have anybody who, you know, is incarnated at this moment. You know, everybody, I've, I've felt like that before. It's like I, in my work life, in my pr virtually every aspect of my life and world, I'm always kind of the daddy. Yep. In every, you know, from when I had 30,000 employees to now, it's, 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 and so I sometimes feel like, you know, Where's my daddy? And I also had a, a hardcore mom. Yeah. My mom was the type of woman that was like, oh, you got all A's and one A minus. Next time, if you get all A's, then I'll really love you. You know, the quintessential tiger. So for me too, I've often felt like, you know, where's, where's my sustenance? Who's going to help inspire me? Yeah. Do you feel like that too sometimes? I mean, in the physical. I, by the way, I also commune with extraterrestrial. 
mainly mainly Arcturian, but um, because that's where I'm from. But do you feel like that? That wouldn't it be nice if if you had somebody in the physical just to be a good friend and not expect something from you? I'm actually okay with a real good exchange. What it is is that I want the right exchange, and that's very difficult to find. Um, in large part because so much of what a person needs in, you know, especially in their private life is very different than, than what they're doing in their public life. We see this with sexuality, right? If you go down to Las Vegas and you walk into this, these, you know, serious S and M clubs where you're, you've got men that are looking for domination. It is crazy how many of them are executives, you know, how many oh, yeah. of them are at the top of the ladder. Why? Because they spend all day, every day in an intense level of pressure and stress what they're wanting in their off time is the exact opposite. They want somebody else to make decisions. They want to be able to just let go for once, you know? And uh, by it, the way, it's... just for your information, I can do everything except the nipple clamps, uh, but all the rest. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so that is a joke, by the way, that's a joke, but no, you're right. That's because of this repression thing. Yeah, what it is is that most people, the transaction most people are looking for with me is just me doing my job 24 hours a day, every minute of the day, and I don't get to have any humanity. So like the desire is definitely to have people who are able to offer those things to me, but they're not usually, you know, they're not usually the people who are being drawn to me. Like when I'm out here and I'm teaching in the world, right, what I'm, what I'm offering people is things like extreme levels of validation. What I'm offering is a stability. Because I can have in my job for sure. Like I can hold that all day long. You watched it on stage. People can just, and I'm like, okay, why do we do that? You know, um, what they're wanting is this, this unconditionality, which I'm definitely able to approach people with. I don't have a no to people. So it's like, I'm acting as a tractor beam for people who have those needs. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, in my career, like if you want those needs, you got to stay in the realm of me interacting with you in terms of my career. You then you cross over into like, you know, Teal Swan's personal life. And like now it's, you know, I, I would love to be have somebody who caretakes. Right now, I would like to be able to have somebody who can hold emotion because over in my personal life, like I have no interest in. A person can't constantly be in that state where they're getting bitten and there's no reactivity. They're getting bitten and there's no reactivity. In the personal life, sometimes I'd like to have a shadow moment, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the desire for to have like a container for strong emotions is one of those things. Um, in my personal or sort of public life, I'm a very strong leader, like crazy strong leader. And it's very instinctual for me. Personal life, I would like to be led. So, you know, you can see how, how, you know, it's, it's not a lie. I mean, what I'm putting out here in the world in my career is not a lie at all. It's just, you know, it's, it's like a, a person has a specific way that they are in a specific setting. I mean, not every person who you know, is in the fight ring professionally wants to fight at home. So basically you've got different modes for what you're doing, but by being out in the public in this mode, you're attracting people based off of that. And then they're like, Oh, this would be the perfect woman to be in a relationship with for me. And I'm like, actually exactly the opposite. If you had pro probably run to the opposite side of the world from me, if you're wanting those types of qualities in a personal relationship. Okay. So I have a question for you. Okay. Are you liking this conversation? Or I love it. I love it. And I love just getting to know you. Okay. Um, Cause I, I'm glad that my viewers are going to get, see this side of you as well, which is not just the stoic yep. side that many would only see unless they meet you in person and then find out you're funny and you've got kind of whimsical and you talk about crazy stuff. Well, you always talk about crazy stuff, but <laughs> one thing I've noticed, and I'd love to get your thought on this. Um, when I have friends that get divorced, mm -hmm. And I asked the the man, and it's always tough because you're either friends through the man or you're friends through the woman, and then the friendships break up because of it's like so lame, right? It's kind of the half of a half of a half math again. Yeah. It's and crazy. I really don't like that. And so um, we'll get to monogamy in a little bit. But question I have for you is this. When I asked the man, why did you get divorced? And he says, she totally changed. 
I said, well, what do you mean? He says, when we got married, she loved sex all the time. She liked to go to football games. She liked to do all the same things I like to do. It was so great. And that was what I married. That was a contract we made. And she completely changed. You know, she doesn't look the same. She's, you know, she doesn't try to keep herself as attractive. She's become this, you know, matronly, you know, bossy person who just tells me what to do and nags at me all day. And she doesn't like football anymore. Maybe she never liked football, but, you know, at least she played like she liked football. Then I asked the woman, you know, why did you get divorced? And her answer is because he never fucking changed. Really? He never grew up. I thought he was going to like evolve and grow and change and become the man that I had dreamt of. And I thought, what an interesting thing this is that the man wants the woman never to change, to look the same, to act the same, to, to see the world the same ways. And the world, the woman wants exactly the opposite of the man <laughs> to evolve and change, to become the man he's supposed to become and evolve with her. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? You're definitely bringing up a more archetypal relationship issue for sure. Yeah. I, I experienced the exact opposite in my personal life, but um, yeah, I, I hear the same thing echoing when I'm dealing with people who are in the middle of divorces or are in um, wanting help with their relationship itself. <sighs> what I make of that women are ridiculous. Why? Because it's ridiculous to meet somebody and think that they're going to change into what you want them to be or the potential that you think they're going to be. And I think one of the hardest things for women to swallow is that, you know, just because somebody has a potential doesn't mean they're going to line up with it because you have to choose to activate your potential. And your potential, I mean, somebody's potential is quite often seen through the veil of, of what would serve you best. And sometimes what would serve you know, him best would not serve you best. And that's very difficult for women to swallow. So if I had my way, they would stop it and play a game with themselves when they're dating somebody, which is if this is how he was for the rest of his life, would I say yes to it? And um, then maybe the man should also ask himself the same question about a reverse. Because for a man to expect a woman never to change, yeah, this is where this is where I'm going next. Is right? ridiculous, also. Yeah, it is. It's ridiculous to 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 not understand that change is an inevitable aspect of life. Not only that, I, I, honestly, when I've been working with men, the most ridiculous aspect that you know, I've, I've so almost called out the women for their ridiculous behavior. Ready for the ridiculous behavior in men? Men think that, that they can slack on containment and that women will stay the same. Now, what I've noticed is when women change, and we get down to the nitty-gritty of why a woman changed in the ways that you've just described, it is, it is I, I'm not kidding you, like, I, go ahead and prove me wrong, but every, t every time I am able to find some element that the man changed first. Ooh, okay, okay. Can you, can you... Let's pull on that string, that thread. Okay. When men are pursuing a relationship and when they're in the beginning of the relationship, they they come on very strong usually. Uh -huh. Now, something that comes with that, that strong come on is what we call containment. Containment is the single most necessary thing for a female when she's in a relationship with a male. Yeah, I've seen your talks about this and I, it really resonates. So, the, I mean, containment's a whole conversation. I've done a video on it if you guys want to see. Mm -hmm. But like when a man secures the relationship right so he's like oh i've got her like there's a commitment usually he'll relax on the containment interesting especially a problem in the modern world because in the in the old world right there are a lot more um physical ever present dangers right now the dangers for women are still there physically but emotionally they're incredibly high much higher than they were before there's never been more emotional unsafety for women than in the modern world today but men struggle with that. They struggle to uh, perceive emotional dangers and to buffer a female from emotional dangers. They were real good with physical dangers. So back in the day when, when what women were facing was, what, not just women, all you know, men too, what people were facing was a lot of these physical dangers. Um, it wasn't an option for a male to drop his containment once there was commitment in the relationship because there's constant hypervigilance to you know, I, I let my guard down for a moment around my family and there's going to be, you know, 
problems. So in the modern world, what I'm watching is that the minute there's that, that commitment, the guy's kind of got the girl, that containment level starts to dwindle. Now, when that starts to happen, the pressure goes up on a, a woman. Now, when you're talking to a woman and she's, let's say she says, well, I had kids and like all my identity went into raising the kids, you know, what you'll notice the difference between the women who, who let themselves go completely and completely focus on the kids. And then the ones who have kids and don't let themselves go completely is they've got the, the male is still providing such a strong level of presence and containment mm. that she's not perceiving all of that pressure. And so it's like, there's a wiggle room there for her to, to not just be, you know, doing this and not just be doing this. So yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, uh, I wish that I had a couple in front of you because it would take me like, it would take me probably like 10 minutes to prove it to you mm -hmm. that, you know, she may be coming at you with like, yeah, this is the reason that I changed. But the precursor is like something that he did before that he's no longer doing. You so know, can you give me an example of how best a, a man can act continually as that container? To, to accept that that's always needed. To accept also, this is what I feel like men need to understand about women first and foremost, um, is that women, they perceive levels of unsafety that men can't relate to. They just can't. I, I have an exercise that I do at my workshops, which I love doing, but it's really sad. You basically have everybody raise their hand who has experienced, you know, a time in their life where they were really fearing for their life. And like every, pretty much everybody's hand is like, oh yeah, that one time at band camp, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> um but then it's like you you start whittling it down. You say, how many of you felt like you're you were in serious danger, like your life even, in the last month? And like a whole bunch of hands will go down, and like you still have a whole bunch of hands up. And at the end of it, you're like, how about in the last hour? I mean, you wind it all the way down. And even though you'll see some women with their hands down, the, it is it is terrifying. It's a social experiment that will completely change your life because what you're looking at is an audience where almost every woman has her hand in the air. So women are, are, they can be compared much more to um, prey animals rather than predatory animals, where constantly in their mind is like danger, 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 danger. Now, the women who don't perceive that have containment from somewhere. Usually they're still getting it from dad or from family. There's still some male in their life that is providing them that sense of security. The ones who don't have that, Okay, so so if men really understood the level of fear that women operate with all day, every day, then they would approach things very differently. Because, I mean, it's like living with somebody with PTSD. If they're in a mode of, like, yeah. a panic and you're relaxed, you're actually indicating you're unsafe. So the men who do the very best with their relationships are the ones who, who are hyper, hyper attuned to that level of, of unsafety. And it's like... Even in situations where they themselves might think it's completely unnecessary, there's a constant reassurance. There's a constant "I'm here." Wow. And and that, like something wild. something that I would like to empower men with because I I mean these conversations can be painful because you know women don't want to be powerless to men, and and so you know they would like me to be able to give them an answer like you're able to do this regardless of what your man does or doesn't do right but that's very limited because if we look at, at polarity right and we break down the the different polarities in the universe and we sorted everything in the universe down to these two polarities initiative is masculine yeah. so it is the male that sets the tone for the relationship okay well that leads me to another one which is that like people know that women usually if they're going to choose to mate with someone right it's the woman who kind of can has the power because women kind of know men can be kind of like dogs right and if she goes after a man she can get that man and yet the paradox is that women want to be chosen what is this concept of being chosen because inside of this concept of uh, the need or feeling or wanting to be chosen, I think is something very deep and profound. That's uh, down to childhood. This is down to childhood. This is not down to female. So we, one thing we need to start to dissect is like, 
you know, our cultural programming and our pain in our childhoods are adding up to something which we are calling innately female, which is not innately female. Females are intensely inclusive. And in a certain set and setting where they don't stand to lose by virtue of, of somebody's attention being on something else, they don't behave this way. Okay, that's interesting. But the reason I raised it is because I felt like the way you described how women all raise their hand when they feel unsafe, right? And that everyone does. So I think there's something related to that being chosen, right? Or for some people and the fear aspect or maybe no. trauma, I don't know. No, no, this is again, this is again, this issue where we are only, it's only, it's like studying an animal only in captivity. We're studying women only within a society which never worked for humanity in the first place. In the context of scarcity. Yes. So okay. here you go. Okay. So a woman, let's say in the context of the conversation we just had, where mm -hmm. a woman wants to feel safe, most women on earth cannot feel safe unless a man chooses her in this sudden setting. Why? That's part of containment because, in a way. Well, what, no, it's not even, it doesn't even have to be. Okay. It doesn't have to be because it, I mean, you could say that, you know, one male is perfectly capable of providing containment for his wife and multiple daughters. So it doesn't have to be, I chose this one woman. Mm -hmm. What it is, is that for most men, for most men, when they choose a female romantically in a monogamous setting, right? That is what guarantees that you're going to be his problem. Now, this is something that I, I we're going to walk out on a limb. You're going to be women. his problem. That's an interesting way to put it. <laughs> well, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge people a little okay. bit. Okay. Because. I'm ready. One of the things that women love the most in relationships, if they're really honest, is that when you enter into a committed relationship with a man, you're, you become his issue. It's like your problems are now his problems. Like you're, you're broken down in your car on the side of the street. Now it's an issue for him. So you, it means you always have some element of positive ownership. It's like you've got this umbrella over you. And that masculine containment, that umbrella is literally everything for a wow. woman. So the security that a woman has in the world often is down to, you know, when she gets in a situation like that, are you going to guarantee he's going to be there? The answer is only if he is not chasing another female. Now, I'm not going to say that that has to be the case. I, in fact, I teach the exact opposite. It doesn't have to be the case, but we still need to look at what is. And what is, is, you know, that the male usually offers that sort of positive ownership, which keeps you very safe you know, and makes your problems his problems. Um, if you've got that, if you're chosen by him, they're, they're not competing. It's essentially okay. the lack of resource, right? You're so not what you're saying is that the, if you're chosen leads to this other aspect of, of perception or belief that he'll be there for you when you need it. Yes. And, and that's the security bit. And the other bit is it means something about your self-esteem. Now, what, what we've done when we went off of our original uh, arrangement as people, and we went to this monogamous way of being, which is not natural for us at all, but when we made that jump, we made that jump by associating so much meaning with monogamy and monogamy being choosing one other, okay? So being chosen as somebody's other now, we have woven into the fabric of what it means to have value. So when, you know, most women, when they f watch a man put his attention on another woman, it is an automatic meaning that they add to it. Therefore, I'm worth less. And so like if a man chooses you, your self-esteem goes, you know, through the roof. So we've got all of these. It's like a layer cake where each layer, like there's so many layers to why, you know, being chosen for a female matters so much in today's day and age. Wow. I, you know, as a mathematician, I love complexity. It might also be why I tend to love female, you know, gender, because I think it's like the complexity is so confounding sometimes, to be honest. It's yep. like, what? Yep. So all these different layers, actually, you, you definitely bridge some gaps in my own mind on some things that I thought were benign, innocuous, that now listening to you, I now understand it differently that the small benign innocuous thing was, and the way I approached it seemingly logically was actually taking away the umbrella. Exactly. So now this is where I see men go wrong 
is that what they are doing with their female in their life makes logical sense, but they are not where she is mentally. So if you, and if you're not in somebody else's reality, you can't respond according to their reality. And I, we're not perceiving the same things. I would love it if we were. It would be much less Mars versus Venus, but. So, and women, women are 50 steps ahead, too. They're usually, because they're very vigilant about danger, they're usually 15 steps ahead. Well, if you do that, then this is what happens next Christmas. I know. <laughs> totally. Yeah, so so it's like, you know, the, the men who are the best at this are the ones who are like, all right, you know what? I, I'm, I'm going to approach this with the level of verve that I would something in my life that I am so obsessed with that I just have to understand every little bit about it. And so they understand the female mind. And so they're already like one step ahead of the female mind that that is a man with very healthy women in his life. So, so do you feel like, um, as a woman that you can fully understand the female mind? Me? Yeah. <laughs> Cause I, I mean, Man, it's it's definitely it can be complex. It can be very yeah, but I, women are very good at communication. That's true. What's I think that women are very capable of communicating to men if men will listen and want to understand. I think we're fully capable of, of explaining ourselves to them. What it is is that we're so trained. So many of us are so trained to 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 not really have a self. You know that we don't really dissect the minutia of ourselves because it's so bad and wrong to be focused on ourselves in that way, so as to convey it to other people. Okay, so this is uh, very fascinating. So then, how do how do we flip this the other way around? You know, men are so kind of simple. We actually are simple, and then when you have all this complexity going, and then I can't tell you how many times one will be like, "Wow, that's all it is." It's that simple. I'm like, yeah, it's like, make sure that I'm fed relatively well. It doesn't have to be great. I mean, I'm not asked for much, you know, that, that I, you know, that I'm taking care of the other way, the other word that starts with F and, and, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's pretty simple. It's like, it's like a dog, right? It's, we're so simple. And so that's why I think we have a hard time fully comprehending the complexity and we step on our you know tails like so many times because we don't even have a clue and that, that took me a long time to realize that and you know half of a half of a half so that's profound that's very very profound but what is it that you think that women don't comprehend about men easily that men need to have a place. And this is a very, very big deal in today's modern world because we're, we're very, we're flirting with disaster here, like on a lot of levels on a relationship level. I, I've never seen what I'm saying today in terms of the amount of disaster we're flirting with on a relationship level. We're getting rid of the exchange between us and getting rid of the reason to be with each other. Right. And more and more women are expected and it's not just by other women. It is by other women, but it's by everybody. They're expected, even at a subconscious level, to do it all, right? Mm -hmm. It's very easy to see that when you when you have a, a child and, like, you know, the dad brings the child to school and everyone's like, oh, my God, he's so involved. A mom brings the child to school. It's normal still. Guess what? Yeah. Both of them have the same jobs. Probably. Yeah, you're right. You're, you're totally right. So, like, you can you can see that there's – right now we haven't stepped out of the 1950s enough but we've adopted a lot of the 1960s mentality. And so now we're operating with both. And so what's happening is that, you know, women are essentially expected to do absolutely all of it. And now it's not just that we're expected to it, like we ourselves, like that's now what we've been told the self-esteem is really about. So what I watch more and more and more and more is that, you know, women because of the 1960s programming are like, you know, they're making no space in their life for a man whatsoever. Yeah. That's dangerous, right? So like, I'm, I'm not talking a little boy. Little boys are different. These are men that are not grown up that are actually looking for that. They want a woman to take all of it. Okay. So, you know, that aside, setting that aside, a man who really wants to be in his masculine, he needs to have a place in a woman's life. He needs to know she needs me in this way and I'm contributing in this way. And so I'm valued in this way. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm working with women in a very extreme way to the, you know, to the opposite of what I told you with men working with women's fear all day long and providing containment, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. every day, right? Mm -hmm. 
the female side of it is like, how do I open, keep opening space for him? Interesting. You so know, the opposite so, of containment is space. Dude, going to Germany is my nightmare. I mean, it's bad in America, but going to Germany is my nightmare because like what you watch there, I've never seen it worse than, than there where it's like, if you're if you're a, a worthwhile woman in that society, you do not make space for a man. You argue to almost you know pay half the bill. You get almost insulted if he's like helping you cross the street. And I'm trying to get women to be like, no, we need to roll it way the hell back. Like you should be yes, yes, yes to to his initiations, attempting to be there for you in these different ways. You know what? You nailed it on Germany. I lived in Germany for three years, and. I have to say it was a, the feminine there was so, um, and, and obviously there are exceptions, so I don't want to make the stereotypical comment, but you know, it was like, sie sind kalt, cold, right? There was a, a very cold aspect to it. And even like I, I, a number of times, like a, a viable pickup line for a German woman to a man is ficken wir oder was, right? Which is like, are we going to fuck or what type thing? And it was so transactional. There was like no romance, no feminine. There are exceptions to this. For all those out there that are like Germans, I love Germany. It's a great place. Having said that, it is what you're saying is there's some aspect of truth to it. And, you know, I, I, I've learned several languages. And the way I learn languages is through listening to the words I hear the most often. So I learned a method for it. So in France, the word you hear the most often is, mais oui, tout à fait, bah bien sûr. It's like, they have like 20 different ways to say, of course. They don't even have one way to say it in German. Mm -hmm. The closest way they say, of course, is naturlich, which is naturally. Yeah. Right? It's very different than of course, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in Germany, the first words I learned were verboten. This is forbidden. Yeah, oh yeah, right? yep. Everything is, das Packblas is verboten, oh, right? It's like, everything is forbidden there, right? Yep. You, you land at the airport, there's a hangar, and on the side of it says verboten on the yep. hangar. It's like, what the hell, the first thing you see. And then the other word they, they use all the time is genau. Genau yep. means exactly. Yep. Right? Genau, genau, yep. So they love exactitude and forbiddenness, right? It's like <laughs> a repressed, let's be real, there's a, there's a repressed aspect to the society. Yeah. And, and so what you point out is 100% true, but how do women then best provide the space? Because I think of the masculine as radiative, and I think of the feminine as gravitative. And so as a result, you know, radiation is light and, and gravitative is dark. As a result, you know, one is going to require containment, right? The other is going to require space to radiate. So how does the feminine give space to the masculine. That's a whole different subject. Like when you, when the way that you're, you're, wait, so we gotta, we have to um, get more specific because most people, when they hear the word space, they, they're hearing a different thing than the, you know, what I'm talking about, right? A woman doesn't want, you know, to feel, to give a man space from her. No, I don't mean from her. Okay. What I don't do mean, mean from her. I mean, like, uh, like hold space. It's, it's not from her. I don't, it's, it's, I, I, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Okay. The women that have done the best with me have been the ones that'll be like, well, I'll give you an example. I'll go out to Mastro's or something. I'm with the guys, you know, and if I'm with a very controlling woman yep. and I have been before, sorry, yep. um, she'll say, when are you going to be home? I'll be like, Oh, uh, like, you know, maybe nine o'clock. She's like, no, you, you need to be home by eight because I've got this. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, she goes, plus, I don't like when you go to that place with those guys. I'm like, okay. So, of course, when she gives me that attitude, there's a part of me, it's like 8.55. I'm in Mastro's and the waitress comes around, pretty waitress. Would you like another drink? Yes. We'll have two more. <laughs> So There's kind of a rebellion thing that kicks in. And it's like, sometimes I don't even do it consciously. But so if, she, if she did the opposite and said, oh, you haven't seen your friends in a long time. I trust you. You know, stay out, do, do whatever. Then 8.55 rolls around. I'm looking at my watch saying, this is boring. So we are, talking about, we are talking about space in terms of vicinity. 
Not necessarily vicinity. It's like. Can we come back to this? Because because yes. What, what I was originally, so let's come back to this one because this is a separate thing. So when I was originally, it's related, but it's a separate thing. When I was originally talking about, you know, women making space for men, what that means is like you have to create an area and a way in your life for him to step in and fill a role. Okay. Okay. That's, that's what I mean. That's still looking at it from a very insular perspective. Because, I mean, because that implies then that, that women don't let, like they have a shield or an umbrella that they make around themselves, like a big umbrella, right, that they cover themselves in. It's like, okay, I'm going to open the door for this one person because he meets the, the checklist of criteria. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't understand. What is your issue with that? I don't understand it. My issue with it is like, I think that empathy is such a critical aspect in being, and you said it earlier, which is like, get into the mind of the pedophile, which is like hard to do, but being able to understand and, and, and play with the thought of what it is that that person is going through. And I think when the feminine does that with the masculine and the masculine does that with the feminine, they find this convergence a lot easier. You're right, but that has nothing to do with this. What this has to do with is that what, what women are chronically doing is they're putting up essentially shields yes. where the, every single thing, place that a man could fit into her life, she, she's a no on. So men are consistently getting rejected. Okay. Yeah, that resonates. So what, what a woman needs to do to the opposite of that is to be like, yeah, open the door for me. I love it. So like when, you know, if like, I'll give you an example. I have made it a practice that if a man offers his hand to me, if we're walking somewhere, you know, like, like, let's say he's trying to, you know, like getting into a car, out of a car, up or downstairs, I will take it every time without exception. So it's the, it's in these little moments basically where, where there's an offering for a man to fill a role in your life in some way, even if it's, you know, some, you know, stranger who's doing that you're saying yes to it rather than no to it. So almost being in that state of receptivity where you're making, but that's me making space in my life for his Present contribution and contribution rather than being like, no, thanks. I can get down the stairs myself. Bam wall. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's the German thing. That's very much the German thing. And I, I, first of all, I don't get to feel like a man in that environment because she's the man. Exactly. And no, no thanks, right? No thanks. But I do think there's a. Okay, so now let's go to what you were talking about mm -hmm. then. Okay. Yes, which is, please. <laughs> which is this, this creating space. So obviously, you're going to be dealing. There are certain women where the level of containment that they need in order to realize that they're secure and calm down is so high that a lot of men can't say yes to that. All right. So I don't want to take it off the table that there are women who are on the far end of the spectrum of needing such an extremely strong version of this that you would say no. Okay. Um, how, but the issue that you're presenting is still a containment issue because like, let's say that a man's really great at containment. He does not start off on the foot in any relationship of, I need my freedom. In fact, he uses the paradox effect, which is he steps in so strongly in terms of providing that sense of security that she calms down and can tolerate autonomy. That's the paradox effect of relationships. Okay. Say that again. She calms down and can tolerate autonomy. Yes. Okay. So the paradox effect in relationships is, is this, and it relates to relationship security. The more security that a relationship has, the more autonomy separation it can tolerate. I like that. The more security a relationship has, the more separation the relationship can tolerate. Yes. Now, this is where p p couples get into big problems. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because what will happen when, when a woman is clinging or even trying to control, that what she's signaling is, I'm unsafe in this moment. Yeah. Now, instead of stepping in and being like, all right. I this, got you. This, this, this <laughs> is taken care of. That, you know, it, and, and that will cause a de-escalation, right? Instead of doing that, a guy starts fighting for his freedom. And thus escalates the whole situation. Bingo. Ding, ding, ding. Winner, winner. <laughs> so what I, when I'm working with men who are, you know, who let's say, I mean, certain men, they like a little bit more space than others, right? Some men are like, no, I really, when I marry a woman, I want it to be that I'm with her every night. Other men are like, no, I, I like to roam a little bit, right? The ones who need to roam 
extra need to to learn about this, right? They also need to not go for women that want to be with somebody 24 hours a day. But let's say that they they pick a woman who's like, yeah, I can do some things by myself. What I help them to do is to is to come in really strong. And in the you know, to start with in that relationship especially, it's a lot about you know, if she indicates any fear about separation, don't create it. You essentially set up a pattern in her mind of like, I can guarantee that if I need him, he's going to be here. So then it's, it's about, it's very easy. It's actually simple. If I was a guy, it'd be so simple for me. It's crazy. So basically it's, it's about thinking ahead. I, of I am, by is. the way, I, this is riveting. I'm listening. Okay. So if, if I, if I was a man in a relationship and wanting to set up this dynamic and I know that I want to go, you know, out somewhere for the night. Mm -hmm. What I would do is I would I would put it on her table in terms of including her and her wanting me to do this. So like if you're with a partner that's worth being with, she's not going to feel good with you not being able to do something you don't like. So the first red flag for me when you when you were describing the woman you were with before is there's no there's no sort of issue in her, in her heart it sounds like when you have a problem or you want to do something. That's not actually normal. What's what's much more normal for a female is that you know, if you say, oh, I really want to see this person, all of a sudden she's in a conundrum because she wants you to experience something right. that makes mm -hmm. you happy. But at the same mm -hmm. time, she's like, oh my God, my needs aren't going to get met. So if I'm in, in the man's position in that circumstance, I'm going to think ahead of her in terms of like what her experience is going to be like so that I can go. Right. So you used to see a lot more of this back in the day. I'm not saying it should look exactly like this. We have to modernize it. But like back in the day, you know, if a man went off to war or something, he was like, and my brother is here in the house and I've already put all these, this food where I've put it. So he's already setting up this entire environment so that his absence does not cause intense levels of pressure on her any more than you're going to miss me. Right. So, and I don't see men in the modern world doing this unless they're, and I have definitely witnessed a few men that are damn good at this. It's like when they're, when they're about to create an absence, they've already thought of everything ahead so that they're indicating to the woman, you're safe in this way. You're safe in this way. You're safe in this way. Worst case scenario got with women. You got to go worst case scenario, worst case scenario. You tell me you're in trouble. I am on an airplane. End of story. Now what happens is the woman goes, is she likely to exercise that? Not after a few times trying. Usually women will test a couple times and if it's met like this, they're calm. I wish I'd had this conversation with you a while ago. It definitely would have helped in a lot of these situations because from the man's perspective of not wanting things to change. Yeah. Like a lot of my relationships are like this. Like I, I if I don't see my brother for months, <laughs> right? Or a long time, it's like the moment we see each other, it's just as if we saw each other yesterday. Yeah, but he doesn't need you in that way. I know, but that's how men get used to having relationships. That's a disaster. Okay, fine. Fair enough. I'm not going to argue with you on this. I'm, obviously, it hasn't worked for me very well. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, let's change gears for a moment. You have some pretty epic tattoos. Okay. Wow. Okay. One of them is on your left wrist or underneath it, and the other's on, under your right wrist. And one of them looks to be, I haven't really been able to see it well, but it looks like it's the Chinese character for Moon. Yep. Yep. And the other one is the Chinese character for Water. Ice. Ice. Mm -hmm. Ice. Okay. See it on the side there. Why did you choose those two? That was my first tattoo, actually. It's ironic that that was the one you picked out. All right. So I, I picked these two because... I went to China when I was 17 and it was the, one of the most life transforming experiences that I had ever had. And um, you were still stuck in the cult then. Yeah. And you got all the way to China. Yeah. My mother drugged me there. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. You want to know what it was? Okay. So mm -hmm. basically it was a group of people that were going with a, like a, a, a Qigong teacher and they were going to be taken to a traditional Chinese medicine center. It was a trip for people with terminal illness. Uh huh. My mother was so desperate in my teen years. I was a complete mess, obviously, as you would be when you are as damn getting as damaged as I was. She was just like, I, I'm sick of Western medicine. All they can do is just like name a different medicine and throw it at it. And nobody knows what's going on with my daughter. So she's like, we're going to swing from West to East, you know? So she called these guys and was like, look, I know that this isn't technically, you know, a terminal illness, but my daughter's had multiple suicide attempts and like, I literally don't know what to do with her. And they were like, yeah, that's a terminal illness. Put her on the, put her on the ship. So basically my mom drags me to China 
And it was interesting because I was approached entirely differently for, from those for those people. Those people recognized immediately, you know, that I had all these you know different spiritual abilities. And they took me away from my mother and away from the rest of the group and put me in with the students who are at this traditional Chinese, you know, medicine center. Because they were learning things like, you know, intense Qigong, you know, energy practices. They were studying to be Taoist priests. They were masters of Kung Fu. So mm -hmm. they threw me in with the students and the students kept calling me Bing Yu, Bing Yu, Bing Yu, right? So Ice Moon, Bing Yu, was the nickname that they gave me. Got it. Okay. And so when I came back from China, I was like, I, I want to go. I was actually the first foreign, you know, person who was ever accepted to become a student over there. I didn't end up going because I was still embroiled in all my abusive situation. But I I wanted to go back so bad that I actually just like wrote them and was like, I, I want to be like one of the students in your center. And like all of the masters basically debated and accepted me. Wow. That, well, that's such an interesting thing because all of those aspects are feminine archetypes ice which would be a cold temperature even cold temperatures associated with feminine in arc in alchemy and moon is feminine and water that is ice is the feminine so that's very interesting why did they call you that they called me that i came i came to find this out actually years after the fact um they came to call me that because just like we see somebody and we're like oh it's santa claus right because it looks like Santa Claus. They have a, a, a figure in their culture called Bing Yu, who is essentially, I, I don't, can't remember whether she was a woman or a deity to begin with, but she essentially saved like all of China from famine, right? So the story goes is that she was so beautiful that the God of the sun fell in love with her and said, you need to belong to me. And she said, I can't belong to one man. I need to belong to all of China. And as punishment, he stuck her in the moon for all time and eternity. And it's her light that shines down on the world. That's beautiful. But, but when they saw me, when the students saw me, apparently, like, I look somehow like this character, which is why they were calling me that. I didn't know that until, like, years after I talked to somebody who was from China who spoke English well enough to be like, why do you have that on you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it doesn't mean ice queen. It's like, <laughs> it's definitely, that's a beautiful story. I love that. You also have another tattoo on your, I think it's your left arm. That is the very famous symbol of alchemy. Yep. And it's the circle with the equilateral triangle with the square inscribed within it and the circle within that. So most of my work, most of what I'm known for is geometry. Okay. Why did you put that tattoo on your arm? Well, all of my tattoos are, are covering over scars that happened during my abuse. So you can kind of see the, this one that's running right mm -hmm. through the center. Right? Mm -hmm. It was like a move to reclaim my body again. Um, I was really interested at the time that I ended up getting this. I was very interested in the concept of alchemy. And of course, the highest form of alchemy being mind, for stone. Mm -hmm. mind over matter. Mm -hmm. So it was just something that like really sort of resonated with me as a... a like a way to live my life. I use my tattoos almost like stepping stones to end a chapter. So it almost feels like when I get one, I'm in a new phase of life and I'm standing sort of on top of this tenant. And how so, long ago did you get that one? I was 20. 20. So that's such a beautiful one. And it's very relevant to what's happening, I believe, in the world today. Um, I, I'm about to go to Egypt in about a week. I, I host trips to Egypt and I'm taking about 50 people on a trip. And a lot of them are kind of like, I don't like the term celebrities, but celebrities, influencer types. And uh, one of the core aspects of this trip is an activation related to the philosopher's stone. There is a pyramid complex that's only newly discovered that is about eight kilometers north of Giza. Have you ever been to Egypt? No. <laughs> I am blown away by that. I'm seriously blown away. You have to come with me to Egypt. You'll you'll have the most amazing time and you'll remember, I'm sure I've, you know, all of your 14, what was it, through, throughout your 14 lives or whatever of non-death, um, which is very symbolic, by the way. 12 lives, but yeah. Oh, I thought it was 14. So 12 yeah. lives. Okay. Yeah. So um, 
it's interesting though because part of the reason we're going is uh, the the throat chakra of earth is supposed to be in giza mm. and the three pyramids on the giza plateau um, are actually musical notes they represent musical interval relationships the height over the base is something i discovered i presented it to a big conference a few weeks ago um called the conference on ancient knowledge and procession of equinox and i look at it all from a geometric standpoint but there there's two new pyramids that are north that are above the throat chakra and they go into the pineal and pituitary gland and the two pyramids that are there there are two shapes of pyramids that would represent philosopher's stone one is an equilateral triangle just like the one you have on your arm the other one is the exact same shape as the one on the dollar bill on the back side of the dollar bill and this is by michael meyer in 1617 he did this thing called atalanta fugions and it, it's been a big riddle in encryption and people are like well this is supposed to represent the eye of providence how do these two things re represent at what they represent to each other one is pineal gland and the other is pituitary gland it just so happens that two pyramids that were found on this elevation that's 300 feet higher than the Great Pyramid are the exact same two pyramids of Philosopher's Stone. One is an equilateral triangle, and they're also the missing notes that are not part of the musical intervals of Giza, the complete a scale, right? So uh, I'm very excited about this because the two pyramids there are exactly one on the back side of the, of the dollar bill, and the other one is the one that's on your arm. And it represents the merger of divine masculine, divine feminine into, in alchemy, because that's where I spend most of my time in study and work, into the super conscious mind, merging the unconscious or subconscious mind through shadow work and integration into the conscious mind. And as I was sitting there, you know, watching you on stage, I was thinking, wow, you really are, you've become the embodiment of this Philosopher's Stone concept. And I just wondered how intentional that was when you were 20 years old, when you put it on, or if it's almost like an encryption you left to yourself in the future. It's more of an encryption. But isn't that amazing? And how many encryptions have you found that you've left to yourself almost through this invisible hand the unconscious aspect of yourself that you leave like little breadcrumbs to yourself. A lot. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's common. It's common because I knew that I was going to go really deep this time. Like you, it's, it doesn't matter how much awareness you've gained in previous lifetimes when you go deep and dark enough into trauma into human trauma the ability to stay above it all does not remain because you still have a temporal aspect and your temporal aspect gets damaged, severely damaged. You need to come to Egypt at some point. I think it, it's a life changing thing. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've been there before in another lifetime, but um, I've spent 14 nights inside the great pyramid and, and four of them all by myself. And it changes you mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like time rips open and you can remember your past lifetimes and all the things that you learned in those lifetimes. You can even remember how to do yep. them, whether it's sculpting or music or art or whatever, you can remember it all. Unfortunately, if you've been bad at relationships, you remember that too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the challenge. I want to thank you so much for taking so much time with me. You definitely illuminated my consciousness today. And, uh, and, I, and I know the viewers very much appreciate getting to know you in this, in this more intimate way, I guess. And, uh, and the invitation stands to you. I'd really love to, uh, to, to host you in Egypt at one point. I think you would not be bored. Okay. <laughs> and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. And, and thank you for all that you do to raise consciousness in the world. You're thank seen you. and you're felt and you're heard. Thank you. Thank you.